Welcome to yet another Privacy and Technology Forum. They just keep getting better and better. Uh, we add rows of seats and they get filled. Um, thanks for registering early. Um, I don't think we've had to turn people away, but it's great to see a full house. Um, we intend to um, make these sessions more widely available as well, so if you think there's something that um, is of value to uh, people in your network, keep an eye on our YouTube channel. We'll be posting the video. Uh, subsequent sessions, we're going to be exploring uh, webcasting as well. We had someone from Gore write in and say, hey, that looks really good. Can I watch it online? Um, and that seems like a really good idea, so we're exploring that. Um, it's um, fantastic to have people turn out to inform themselves about uh, new technology and privacy and, and the role that, um, you know, the, what the meeting points are. Still seats at the front, guys. Um, you didn't come here to hear from me, I know, so I'll get on with it. I uh, first met Vikram back in the mid-2000s, about, about over 10 years ago, I think, when he was um, program manager at um, uh, SSC, running a thing that used to be called the Government Login Project. Um, and I was engaged to undertake privacy impact assessment of that. Um, and, you know, I had, up until that time, not met anyone in the IT sector at all who got privacy in quite the way that Vikram did, um, which was great, um, but it kind of made it a bit difficult for me because every time I'd ask a question, he, he had have thought of it already and said, you know, th this is the answer. So he basically dictated um, the, uh, the report and then paid me for it. Um, <laughs> it's not entirely true. Um, but um, Vikram's career has gone from uh, the private sector solutions for telecoms into uh, this pu public service creating this infrastructure for safely interacting with government online. That government logon service, as you probably are aware, morphed into real me, um, which is still having a few teething troubles. Um, or critical mass issues, perhaps, um, but you know, remains, I think, a really fine example of uh, how we can have our cake and eat it too. We can interact in the online world in ways that preserve our privacy um, safely, so I'm a big fan. Um, uh, you will have heard of his uh, subsequent career um, with, uh, I can't remember the order of things, but um, as Chief Executive of Internet New Zealand, uh, Vikram really built up the policy side of that organisation, uh, moved into um, MEGA, which is you know, a unique opportunity for anyone in this country to be part of a, a globally influential startup. And certainly, you know, coming out of the crucible of uh, um, what, whatever its predecessor was called, um, MEGA Upload, um, you know, just the, the learning opportunities are immense. And moving from that back into the very public sphere of uh, Internet New Zealand, um, there's, there are a few people more qualified to comment on the uh, sort of privacy implications of emerging technologies. And among the emerging technologies are these virtual currencies, um, which uh, you may have heard about probably... Does anybody here own bitcoins? One, one person. So I suspect if I asked that question in 12 months' time, we'd see a lot more hands, or maybe it would be altcoins of some other description. Um, and th they're a bit of a puzzling concept. You know, when you first uh, start the conversation about them, people scratch their heads and say, well, you know, how can you have confidence in this Im imaginary thing that carries no intrinsic value? Well, you know, look inside your wallet. Um, <laughs> You know, our current currency system is based on faith, um, but we need people like Vikram to, um, to explain how it works, to, to, to explain why we can have confidence in it and why it makes um, sense uh, in the online world to be able to engage a currency that we can deploy anonymously, not just to purchase smack on the Silk Road on our uh, Tor browser, um, although, you know, whatever's your thing, um, but to, to um, securely engage uh, on what are fundamentally insecure networks. Um, so, uh, Vikram, I'll turn it over to you and um, hope that you have plenty of questions and uh, comments for the um, YouTube channel as well. Thanks very much for coming again. Uh, Kia ora. Welcome. I just wanted to start off with two personal observations uh, about bitcoins and the things that we're going to talk about. The first is that the conversations that are happening around Bitcoin are very similar to the conversations that happened around the internet and the web when they were first born. Uh, there's excitement, there's hope, 
there's ideology, there's fears. Um, and so it seems that we've been here before and we, we collectively have a better understanding of what plays out and how things play out from here. The second is, uh, and picking up on what John said about Bitcoins and Silk Road and media coverage. I know a lot of people who have come to Bitcoins as skeptics. They think it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, how does it work? How can there be any value? And a lot of the technical people who've looked at Bitcoins and they came as skeptics have gone away impressed and have gone away becoming evangelists for Bitcoin. And so one of the things I wanted to try and do today was to try and give you a bigger picture of what's happening, not focus so much on the technology because sometimes we get lost in the detail, but take a step back and look at Bitcoins, look at these alternative currencies. Um, the term Bitcoins is used in different contexts. Part of the issue is that Bitcoin refers both to a currency as well as to a technical platform. And so when people use the term Bitcoins, you might get puzzled exactly what are they talking about. And so for me, this is the current landscape where that shiny B in the middle represents Bitcoin, the currency. Um, it's run on a technology called the blockchain. And a lot of alternatives to Bitcoins have come up, which collectively are called altcoins. <coughs> Most of them run on the blockchain, but not all of them. And over the last year or so, there's been a movement towards what they call Bitcoin 2.0, which also runs on the blockchain, but doesn't have to. And so a lot of this uh, confusion is quite normal when things are first starting off. But I think it's worth being aware that Bitcoins is, as a term, uh, could cover currency, but it could also cover much wider ecosystem around it. And starting off about six years ago, the first few people who got attracted to Bitcoins was the crypto community, because that's what uh, at the heart of Bitcoins is crypto cryptography. So the crypto community was the ones who were really interested in this. And once the crypto community started having a bit of a look at it, um, a lot of the idealists came along and got attracted by Bitcoins. The people who were anti-establishment thought uh, central bankers and the government shouldn't get involved or had no trust or confidence in them. They were libertarians who were uh, progressive in their ideas around how does the community itself manage money. Uh, a lot of this attracted economists who dusted up the old theories of what is money, what is a currency, because Bitcoin started challenging quite a few of those concepts. Soon after the economists, a lot of the business people with money came in because there was money to be made. There was money to be scammed. Um, and a lot of money poured in and a lot of money is generating the economy at the moment. And when you have a lot of money, you also have a lot of bad guys. Uh, there's a lot of scams. There's a lot of people who've taken a bit of a hit, which then attracts policy and lawmakers particularly from um, either a taxation perspective or from the perspective of consumer protection. So that's a pretty typical scenario of what happens in a startup, particularly when it's got to do with money. So uh, the way I've structured it for today is that I'll talk about two thirds of the time, we look at currency, money, uh, do a bit of a Q&A, and then I'll talk about 10 minutes after that on decentralization and Bitcoin 2.0, and then we have another Q&A at the end. Right, uh, so starting this, bit of history. Bitcoins didn't come out of nowhere suddenly one day, right? Bitcoins, uh, many of the components of Bitcoin have been around for a long, long time. Uh, particularly David Shom and Stephen Brands, but there's a whole lot of other people and so parts of these uh, system have all been put together. But the defining moment for Bitcoin was the November 2008 paper uh, by a person or a group of person whose identity is still unknown, who called himself or herself or itself the group, Satoshi Nakamoto, who published a paper in November. And then in January 2009, which is just over six years back, 
the network came into existence. Um, as soon as it came into existence, uh, the crypto community had a good look at it. There were quite a few attacks. Many of the early attacks were a denial of service type attacks on the Bitcoin as a network. In August 2010, there was one major security flaw that was discovered and it led to a small amount of uh, disruption in the whole industry. April 2011, so that's uh, just over four years back, the first altcoin was launched, which was called Namecoin, um, and then that was followed by a whole lot of alternatives to Bitcoin, including things like Litecoin, which I'll talk about. And uh, one of the really notable things that have happened in 2014, there was an exchange where people could exchange Bitcoins for fiat currencies and backwards called Mt. Gox, which at the time that it collapsed um, accounted for 70% of all transactions at that time. And so if you look at the history, um, one of the things that stands out is it's not been smooth. There's been a lot of attacks, and yet fundamentally the network has stood up, which I think uh, it, for people who question will Bitcoin as a network survive, the chances are quite high that it will, because it has so far. And I can tell you there's been a lot of attacks, a lot of money at stake here, millions and millions of dollars. Uh, the top graph, I just tried to show you what the price of Bitcoin against the US dollar has been like. And so you'll see a flat line for a, a very long period of time. And then it went almost vertically up. It touched $1,000 uh, for Bitcoin. And over the last um, two years, it's been pretty much in a decline. Uh, so that's the full history of the price of Bitcoin against the US dollar. Almost nothing, sharp bubble, um, and then a slow decline. The lower graph shows the price for the last three months. And um, I think what, I'm, what I wanted to show here was that even when the price has been reasonably flat in the last three months, a daily ex price change of four to six to seven percent is no big deal. It happens every day. And that's a huge amount of volatility. A lot of people think that the volatility will ultimately kill Bitcoin because no business can expose themselves to this much of currency risk. Um, I think the history has shown that whenever there have been new innovations and there's been a lot of immaturity in the market, then price swings are quite common. But um, it's very hard for businesses. And so even businesses today that accept Bitcoins tend to change it into fiat currency almost immediately because their business is not to have a 5% currency change every day. So volatility is definitely an issue. On the supply side, um, Bitcoin has been specifically designed to mimic the supply of gold. It's a conscious decision that was taken by the designers. And so just as you've got gold, if you have a mine, uh, there's a fixed amount of gold and it slowly declines. The supply slowly declines. And that's exactly the way Bitcoins is going to work. Uh, there's a fixed supply, there's 21 million. There will never be more than 21 million if the code doesn't change. It's in the code. Uh, the supply reduces geometrically. And we are where that arrow is, we're, we're about six years in. Uh, think about it'll take 2033 before we get most of those 21 million. So in the first few years, we have already got two thirds of the Bitcoins that will ever be produced, around 14 million at the moment. Um, and the way Bitcoin gets produced at the moment is that approximately every 10 minutes, there is a block of transactions that gets confirmed. And the reward for that block is 25 Bitcoins. And that goes to the company that secures that. So roughly today, there's about $1 million of Bitcoins being produced every day and being handed over to the miners who secure the network. Because the supply will decline, while the amount of activity of Bitcoins keeps on increasing, the currency, Bitcoin as a currency, is inherently and designed to be deflationary, which is quite different from many of the fiat currencies that we know, where we assume inflation 
and the supply of money will continue. And we also assume that the central bank and the government will use monetary policy. You can't use monetary policy with Bitcoin. The, su the supply is fixed. You can predict how many Bitcoins there will be at any point of time in the future. And that's the way it works. It's hard coded in. Perhaps a little lesser known fact is that much of the activity of Bitcoins today in exchanging from Bitcoins to fiat currencies is from China. Approximately two thirds of all the currency exchange that happens every day is by Chinese exchanges to do with the yuan. The US dollar and the euro, a little bit, but by far the price uh, on the demand side is a derivative of what happens in China. And that's why a lot of people in the Bitcoin industry keep a really good uh, lookout of what's happening in China. But uh, the exchanges is also the part where the scams and a lot of money has been lost, including things like Mount, Mount Gox. So um, increasingly regulators around the world are looking at exchanges. And the exchanges are, in a sense, a weak point because the Bitcoin network itself is secure. It's everything is signed, there's crypto, there's a whole lot of software. It's all, it's running smoothly and it's very secure. But if you look at the larger Bitcoin ecosystem, it's the exchanges which are one of the weak points. And the reason they're a weak point is because one person has control of the Bitcoins and the fiat currency. So the, the way these ex exchanges work is that people deposit a fiat currency like US dollars or New Zealand dollars and they get Bitcoins. But the control of both sides of that transaction are with the exchange. And that's the weak point. And that's what's attracting a lot of the regulatory interest at the moment. So there is full anti-money laundering provisions now coming in to the Bitcoin exchanges, including know your customer and suspicious transaction reporting, which could be something like maximum of $10,000. So what used to be, if you like, the wild west of the exchanges, where you could just walk up, exchange your, your normal money into Bitcoins. Um, there's, at the lower level, that still happens, but possibly $100, $200 maximum. But once you get beyond that level, uh, the whole industry has shifted because of regulation to anti-money laundering laws and know your customers. Uh, there's also issues around taxation laws. Is Bitcoins a currency? Is it a commodity? How should it be taxed? And there's some amount of privacy concerns, which of course I talk about today. Um, and I haven't, I'm not gonna talk at all about how Bitcoins works uh, at the technical level, but if anyone is interested in the, tech, uh, in the technical, right from scratch, this is the book to read. Um, absolutely the best book out there right now on Bitcoins, uh, written by Andreas. He's a, a great speaker, he's a great evangelist on behalf of the industry, uh, he's a great writer. And uh, I saw this book, it's, even now it's a, you can get it from the usual places, but it's also available for free. So Andreas put this on um, this, the O'Reilly Labs website where it's still available for review before publication. And so there's been a lot of crowd review of the book. Ab absolutely the best book out there. So uh, coming to Bitcoin itself, um, three things I wanted to talk about. The first is, I personally think Bitcoins is, is just a beautiful design. What Satoshi Nakamoto, or he, she, the group did, was take things that people already knew, added one or two more things which are important and we'll talk about them. Um, the consensus in the industry is, this is a beautiful design of the network. It's elegant, it's simple, it's scalable, it's rock solid. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people in the technology side of things get attracted because the Bitcoin network is so well designed. And one of its biggest innovations is that you don't need to trust anyone. So if you think about how currencies work, how the reason we have banks is because you need trusted intermediaries. I take a real life example, um, New Zealand exporter sending their goods to Argentina. You need a trusted intermediary who will um, handle the documents, who will handle credit, and who will handle the actual money exchange. 
And that's the way we all understand how, without thinking about it, how the banking and the financial system work. And the reason we need trusted intermediaries is there is no other way for two strangers to interact with each other with confidence. No trust. There's no, there isn't a trade me reputation that you can go on. There is nothing, right? Um, and what Bitcoins did was to solve that problem. So it, it's, it solves the problem of people who don't trust each other. But it goes even further. Even the people who are transacting or who are managing this network, you don't need to trust them. In fact, it is assumed that there are, that there are bad people out there and that those bad people are going to try and do their best to disrupt things and make scam things and make money. And that's the beauty of Bitcoin at the network level, is that it works without the need of trusted intermediaries. And the other really good thing, which I think made a big difference to why Bitcoin has been successful, is it's the first system of digital cash that aligns the incentives that everybody has. And the way it does that is it has a group of people called miners. Now, these are the people who are working in their self-interest. and But the system is designed to further their self-interest. And the system is designed that they secure the network. So the trade-off is they secure the network with the transactions that they do, and they get rewarded for it in bitcoins. There are people who use the system, who can try and, and scam the system. But each participant has uh, their, their role well aligned with everybody else's interests. And so it's not Bitcoins as a technology alone, but it's also the system as a whole, which has incentives for everyone to work together. And, and that's the core reason why and how Bitcoins is different from everything that came before it. Uh, the term wallets would sort of indicate that you're, you've got these Bitcoin thingies, physical things that you put in a wallet. And that's not quite how it works. Um, even the term wallet isn't actually quite accurate. It's more um, accurate to say a Bitcoin wallet is like a key ring where you've got a number of keys. Certainly, if you lose the keys, you lose whatever the key opens. And just like the exchanges, the wallets are another part of the Bitcoin ecosystem, which have weaknesses because there is what they call custodial control. That is, a person could potentially have all the Bitcoins under their control. And so when we look at regulation, whether it's from a, policy, whether it's from a privacy perspective or uh, protecting customers, these are the weak points that are ripe for regulation, not necessarily the Bitcoin network itself. And there's been a lot of innovation in the last one or two years focused on wallets, and they've become much more secure than they have ever been. But they still remain the weakest part, because except for people who are very sophisticated and have hardware or have it on paper, uh, wallets are the part which you need a username and password. And when you bring human beings into it, you're certainly introducing weaknesses. The third thing is that despite everything you hear, Bitcoins are not anonymous. In fact, it's the very opposite. Every transaction that happens in Bitcoins is recorded, verified, and publicly available to anyone and everyone. It, it's a, it would be in the government's interest to have people use Bitcoins instead of cash. Cash is not traceable. Every Bitcoin transaction is traceable. And that's the really important thing to remember. Um, and I'll talk about how certain add-on services are trying to add on, add on that bit about protecting people's identity. But the Bitcoin network itself is completely public. Anyone and everyone can simply go and download every transaction that has ever happened. And that's exactly the way, for example, in the case of Silk Road, that's exactly the way the FBI did it. They took an address and they were able to verify everyone who has ever transacted with that address at any point of time. It's a perfect record. Um, there are some services, like what they call the laundry services and mixing services, which lets you do a little bit of that, um, of mixing the Bitcoin so you can't track them back. Um, probably a bit dubious, um, depending on the jurisdiction. But there are um, now wallets which 
basically generate a new Bitcoin address for every transaction. So it becomes harder and harder to go and track everything. Okay, uh, talking now about altcoins. Altcoins are essentially alternatives to Bitcoins in some way. Um, and I'll just zip through this because there are about 900 of them and the number just keeps growing every day. Uh, nobody has a real count of how many they are. And uh, there's just nine altcoins out of 900 that have a market capitalization of over $10 million, which means that the vast majority of altcoins are still very small, very insignificant in the bigger picture. Uh, Bitcoin's market capitalization is about $3.3 billion. So $10 million is a really small amount. And altcoins are, I won't tarnish all of them, but a large number of altcoins are where scams happen. A large number. Uh, a new altcoin will get announced. All the miners will pump it up, mine it, and then they'll just dump it. And so you had just over and over again, um, altcoins have become pretty bad, most of them. But out of 900 of them, surely some of them are interesting, right? Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a few of them, but just keep in mind that altcoins are increasingly where the scams are happening. So the first one is Ripple. Um, arguably, it may not be an altcoin, depending upon one's definition. Uh, there's a guy, very controversial guy, called Jed, uh, Jed McCaleb, who's uh, kind of a divisive figure in the industry. Either you love him or you hate him. Mostly people hate him. Um, but, you know, he's considered to be really brilliant. So he was the one who redeveloped Ripple. Which, is the, which has a market capitalization of 440 million. He had a fight with them, left them. Uh, he's just now started a new company called Stellar, which uh, many people are calling the Bitcoin killer, which doesn't make sense. Um, so in any case, Ripple as an altcoin, if it is one of those, is by far the largest one that's out there. The second largest altcoin and the one that's probably quite well known is called Litecoin. Um, in 2011, it came from Bitcoin, but uh, what it tried to do was instead of taking 10 minutes for, a, for the first confirmation, um, it takes only two and a half minutes. Because if you imagine if you've made a transaction um, and you need to wait 10 minutes f to confirm that you've got the money or paid the money, that's just too long for most people. Um, in fact, the, the rule of thumb in the industry is you wait for six confirmations. Um, that's 60 minutes. So a payment system where it takes 60 minutes to get confirmation of a payment isn't that useful in many cases. So Litecoin tried to come and try and fix that. Oops, sorry, I'm almost done. Um, the fifth largest one is two altcoins, which I'm gonna focus on now because they promise to, be, uh, to, to let people be anonymous. The fifth largest one is called Darkcoin. It's got a market capitalization of 14 million, and it obscures the transactions and the IP or internet protocol addresses. And the other one is called Zero Cash, which is still under development. But I wanted to talk about this because the technique that it uses, uh, which is a big name, ZK Snark. The ZK is really interesting, that's zero knowledge. And what it does is, it's a new crypto way of being able to prove that something is right without revealing that thing in the first place. And for people who are interested in privacy and designing privacy, ZK Snark is the one that is most useful to us as a community. Um, I've already seen it popping up in quite a few other places. Uh, some of you might have heard of a new service or a website called Dark Leaks, where anyone can leak anything. Um, government secrets, software, um, you can sell services. And how do you trust what you're going to get without seeing it? Because if somebody is selling you a government secret, obviously um, everyone, no one's gonna trust each other. There's gonna be scams, there's gonna be a lot of bad people, right? So the way that it works is that without, with zero knowledge of what it is, you can still have confidence that um, it's actually true and correct, or it actually exists. 
So zero, zero cash is the one, I think, to watch in terms of being anonymous. And finally, I just wanted to talk about Dogecoin um, because it's sort of become very serious at this point, you know, all of this anonymous and scams. Dogecoin is the fun, guys. Uh, there's the community. It brings back the community into it. It started off as a prank. Very quickly, it became the tipping, uh, online tipping. Um, and that's the really important part of Dogecoin as the community. It was completely broken. The community rebuilt it. And even today, Dogecoin, um, the reason why it's still got a, a decent market capitalization, despite it being a joke, is because the community has regained ownership of money. And that's what they wanted. Right, quick summary about uh, currencies. Um, I think we've, what we've seen so far is that Bitcoin shows that decentralized currencies without a central banker, without trusted banks, may work. And I use the word may because it's working so far. But things change very quickly and very rapidly in this industry. It's definitely still immature. Um, the network itself is very strong and secure. But the ecosystem has weaknesses such as the exchanges and the wallets, regulations increasing. Bitcoin is definitely not anonymous. Um, it's pseudonymous to the extent that an identifier is used. It's really easy for government and law enforcement to convert that identifier into true world identity. My own, my own personal view of the future of Bitcoins is that it will succeed in niche applications where uh, the conventional monetary system or banking systems are expensive. For example, international remittances. Western Union is a real ripoff in terms of how much it charges. Um, it will also work where the banking system is simply unable to meet the demand. And this is particularly in the case of unbanked. There's, a, there's billions of people around the world who don't have access to a bank and will never have because of the identity requirements. And, and Bitcoin provides a low-cost way of getting to them. And third, which the one that I'm really interested in, is digital applications. Uh, I don't see Bitcoins replacing fiat currencies for everyday use anytime soon. And where it will succeed is what it's good at, where it's different. And where it's different is it's digital. It's electronic money. Uh, and you can program money. And we'll see a lot more applications, and particularly in the second part of the talk, a few more applications of how, we, how this is being used. But to me, the future of Bitcoins will be in those areas where fiat currencies or physical currencies simply don't make sense. Right, uh, that's Bitcoins, currencies. I'd love to take any questions or comments from anyone. So the question is, how, are we, how do we differentiate between Bitcoin and the underlying technical infrastructure? <coughs> In the case of Bitcoins, it's one of the same. You uh, the underlying infrastructure mostly is blockchain, but there's a whole, whole network um, that is tightly integrated with Bitcoins. But the underlying infrastructure can be replicated, it can be replaced, or it can be reused for other purposes. And that's how we differentiate between that. So for example, you could have an altcoin that uses the blockchain, which is an underlying platform, but not Bitcoin itself. It's not Bitcoin. Or you could have the network being used for completely non-financial reasons, but it's not currency. So in the case of Bitcoin, it's absolutely tied together. But it is possible to break those pieces apart and reuse them in different ways. And, and that's when you need to know what exactly, when somebody says Bitcoin, do you mean the currency? Do you mean the network? Post Snowden uh, assessment of the security of the blockchain, yes. Um, and most of that is at the cryptographic level. So um, one of the things that we learned out of the Snowden revelations is the maths works. Um, some of the cryptographic protocols are badly compromised, but the ones that are chosen by Bitcoin, particularly its elliptic curve cryptography, ECC, those are solid. And if there's one thing that works in today's chaotic, untrusted world, the math still works. So yeah, and in a sense, it gets tested every day. I mean, just imagine a money out there, right? $3.3 billion. Everyone's having a crack at it every day. Every day it's being tested. 
So what's happening in the local scene in New Zealand? Um, that's actually a really good question because I should have covered that off. It's a good point. Um, good and bad. The bad is the first ATM open and shut down. Um, the good is that there's a difference in the approach to regulation and lawmaking in New Zealand and Australia versus, say, the US and the UK. In the US, every regulator is falling over themselves to try and justify why they should regulate Bitcoin. In New Zealand and also in Australia, there's been a little bit of, let's just watch the space. What are the real risks here? What are the real issues here? Um, and from a privacy perspective, I think our biggest strength is that New Zealand follows a principles-based approach, which means that when we have new things coming, there's no problem. Um, whereas the US, they tend to follow a um, silo by silo approach. So I think the New Zealand is, right now, it's still early days. There's a little bit of activity going on. There's a lot of interest, a lot of skepticism. Um, a lot of the coverage is simply um, Bitcoins is a flaky idea, sort of summary. There was a Bitcoin conference end of last year, Queenstown. It was really good. Um, and I think the thing that I learned there was that a lot of the banks and Baymark and the others are all looking at this to see if there are components of Bitcoin which they can adopt to increase their own efficiency. So not as a whole system, but when you break it down. So the catch-22 of Bitcoin has high volatility, therefore less people want to use it, therefore it has more volatility. Um, and looking at other industries, what's tended to happen is instruments have come in which allow management of risk. And that's beginning to come into Bitcoin. So hedging, for example, or future contracts, they're coming in. Um, but right now what's happened is that every time a major manufacturer or merchant says, we're going to accept Bitcoins, the price of Bitcoin goes down. Because what everybody knows is whether you're Dell or Microsoft or whoever, as soon as they get Bitcoins, they're going to sell it. So the, the selling pressure increases. Um, and that's a real challenge for the Bitcoin industry, is where are those killer applications? How do you get mainstream adoption? Because at the moment, it's struggling with only early adopters. It hasn't got to mainstream. And until that happens, the volumes will not allow a stability of price. There's a d deep division within the Bitcoin industry. Leave us alone versus good regulation will increase confidence and take it into mainstream. What's the difference? Um, there'll always be a huge difference because Bitcoins will fundamentally be a um, trust. It doesn't have the same trust mechanisms. It, it doesn't have a supply issue. So government and central bankers cannot change the supply. They can change the demand, but they can't actually change the supply. The low cost that Bitcoin has simply can't be replicated by banks. What banks and payment institutions are doing and will do more, almost certainly is take components of the Bitcoin system to reduce their own costs. That will definitely happen. The payment, the international remittance industry is is going to face a real problem. Um, I think banks will start seeing areas where others, where the, if the only value that the bank was adding was trust, because of its position, that will start getting threatened. Uh, the real changes will come when you can't separate payments. And, and this will lead me on to the next section. We're looking, right now, all we've spoken about is money and currencies. But money and currencies don't exist in isolation. They exist as a part of a value chain. And what Bitcoins and the next part of Bitcoin 2.0 is disrupting that value chain. And that will disrupt the industries, not because it's simply money or currency. OK, um, I'll move along to the next section now so that we get a few minutes at the end on that part. Bitcoin 2.0. Um, it's the platform. So, so far, we, I've been speaking about Bitcoin as a currency, and now I just want to talk about Bitcoin as a platform. And, and sort of just repeating that, uh, Bitcoin itself is completely tightly integrated with its platform, but that platform can be reused for other things, and that's what we want to look at. 
And so there's a thing called the blockchain, which is the fundamental new thing that the Bitcoin network has created. Um, and it turns out that the blockchain potentially is more game-changing than Bitcoin as a currency. That's my view, but it's also a view shared by other people. Um, and, and we'll have a look at the blockchain and, and what we can do with the blockchain and why it's, it's a technology step change. Uh, but what it can do is to allow secure, scalable, open platforms which provide coordination to exist. Um, and it's most definitely not limited to currency or financial systems. So what's the blockchain? The blockchain is a ledger, right? It's a simple recording. It's an ordered, it's an ordered transactions. But it's got some really interesting characteristics. The first thing is all the transactions are verified before they're put into it. They can't change. Once something goes into the blockchain, you can't change it. Now, the negative aspect of that is, as a currency, if you pay someone Bitcoin, you have no, you can't ever change that. You can't get it back. So merchants love it because there's no chargebacks. But once a Bitcoin transaction has been sent or an altcoin transaction, that's it. There's no coming back. The third thing is it's public. Anyone and everyone can replicate and verify the transactions independently. And what it does is the blockchain is a recording of what's happened. And what is truth? Truth is when everyone or most people have a consensus. And so the blockchain has become a way of getting consensus among parties who don't necessarily trust each other. And not only do they not trust each other, you know some of them are trying to scam you. And yet, it's, it's, this is the big change that the internet made one step forward and the blockchain takes that forward, is we now have a way of being able to transact online, which is completely insecure in a trusted, secure manner. And we look at some examples of that. The first is probably the most simple and yet useful feature that you can get from the blockchain. It's called timestamping. Um, it, you take a document, take the cryptographic fingerprint of the document and put it in a blockchain. It's simple. And what it does is that it proves publicly that a document existed at a point of time when it was put in the blockchain. And secondly, that the, the document hasn't changed. And this very simple thing now becomes the foundation for a whole new amount of innovation. The whole copyright system is beginning to think about, they had this problem of how do I prove that a particular song or a video existed at a point of time. Patents have the same problem. You know, the recommendation for patents is put it into a sealed envelope and post it to yourself and don't open it. The blockchain just does that straight away. Um, so we see a lot of applications from the very simple time stamping. It could be receipts. Uh, the other day I was thinking about, you know, if you buy uh, a laptop or you buy something expensive, the fact that you've purchased it, put that into the blockchain, and then you don't have to look around for receipts or is it still in warranty. It's just publicly available to everyone. The second is a thing called side chains. Uh, so I've been talking about a blockchain, which is the Bitcoin blockchain. But there are, in fact, many blockchains. Um, and one of the issues that's happened with the Bitcoin industry right now is there's been, because there's so much of money at stake, there's a lot of vested interest. And that slowed down innovation. The only way Bitcoin now changes is by consensus. So consensus from vested interest is really, really hard. Um, and innovation has slowed down a lot in Bitcoin. So the way people are getting around that is they're creating these alternate blockchains which they mostly connect up with the main blockchain. But you get the best of both worlds. You get innovation happening on the side, but you get the stability from the um, big size of Bitcoins. Third is the Internet of Things. Um, the blockchain is a ledger, so it acts as a database. And you can use that to connect up the billions of devices that are coming. There's some work being done by IBM and Samsung at the moment. They're working on um, this thing called ADEPT. And this is where I need to make a full disclosure so that you take this with a bit of pinch of salt. Uh, I work for a startup, and this is our area of focus, um, where we are building a new internet, of which the blockchain is a key component. 
and our first area of focus is the Internet of Things. So I could spend a whole hour just talking about the privacy and security of the Internet of Things, but I won't. But um, certainly this is one area where the blockchain uh, is hugely important. The fourth one is, this is um, user-centric identity, where uh, one software programmer decided that if the blockchain can give us documents publicly available, why not identity documents? And this he came up uh, with this proof of concept of a blockchain passport. Uh, obviously, no one's going to accept this. But it does start raising some real interesting policy questions about um, identity, how do you get identity, how do you verify identity. Obviously, in this case, the, the source of identity is social networking. So it's only going to be as strong as the social network is. But we've now got a point where you can produce documents, physical documents, that have public verification attached to it. So imagine all the registers and everything else. You can just make them public. Um, all of this leads me to saying that there is a new wave of decentralization that is almost certainly coming. Uh, decentralization is the opposite of cloud computing. It's the opposite of hierarchy. It's the opposite of how we all think every day. Uh, it started with BitTorrent, uh, got a bad name, because now you had peer-to-peer -peer exchange of copyrighted materials, uh, copyright infringement. But decentralization is something that policymakers and people who are interested need to start getting their heads around. It's about things acting locally. To some degree, they may be autonomous or independent. To some degree, they may not be. Um, but the last couple of years, this is where the innovation is happening. And this is as a heads up in terms of what's coming over the next two to three years is a huge wave of decentralization. That includes the Internet of Things. Uh, much of the Internet of Things are physical objects that act locally. And there seems to be a um, notion that cloud computing is the only way of the IT and ICT industry in the future. That's absolutely not true. Um, cloud computing is a huge centralization mechanism, whereas decentralization is coming. Uh, autonomous agents is, are here. <coughs> These are agents that act on your behalf, but you don't have to do anything. So uh, these are things, small pieces of software, for example, that can go and look on the internet, find you stuff, do stuff for you. Um, and then the next step is decentralized organizations, which is what I wanted to talk about. These are organizations that could be built and could exist today. They don't because it's too expensive and too hard. But within six months to 12 months, uh, this will become really easy to do. And it will be used for good, but it will also be used for bad. So I wanted to give you an example of how it, will be, it could be used for bad, because bad is more fun. So here's an evil guy. Right? So DAO is a decentralized uh, autonomous organization, or a DAC if it's a corporation. So um, a lot of our policy thinking, privacy thinking, is based on interacting with people or organizations. What happens when you interact with software that is autonomous? Um, that's sort of a question. So here's an example of an evil one. Uh, that's the one at the center. It's a DAO. And let's say it runs an evil marketplace sort of Silk Road reincarnated. But uh, it's easy for a piece of software, completely autonomous, completely independent, written once, running in a distributed fashion, completely on its own. And it's running a marketplace. So you can buy and sell things. And when you run a marketplace where there are few restrictions, you're almost certainly going to attract drugs, um, malware, all sorts of scams. So that's, let's just call this an evil marketplace, Silk Road 3.0 or 4.0. And the DAO um, gets some profit from the commission, which it gets in bitcoins. And this is what I meant by bitcoin doing stuff that fiat currency can't do. It's digital money. So it's really easy for the DAO, which is a software program, to run another software program, a marketplace, and get money electronically. And then it uses that money to pay for hosting services, it can buy human services, you know, things like Amazon's Mechanical Turk. 
you post things there, people bid for it, and they do stuff for you. Um, and then it can use the bitcoins, that is the profit. It can either launder it or it can convert it into dark coins, and then it can pay the bad guys. So here's a completely autonomous, decentralized, distributed service software running on its own with no controls. And our policy controls today are, are OK. You know, There's enough there. We'll follow the money. We'll follow the bad guys. We'll shut down things. But I'm not saying this will happen. But decentralization implies that you have autonomous software running a lot of things. And any principle or any policy intervention that looks to human beings or things that you want to go and shut down doesn't quite work anymore. So the summary is uh, the blockchain is a technology step change. New wave of decentralization. There's a lot of innovation happening there. And some of these may require us to rethink uh, privacy issues, may, re may rethink some of the instruments and tools that we use. Uh, one classic one is, for example, New York has just banned fractional lending uh, of bitcoins, which is the way monetary policy and monetary tools are used to control credit. But Bitcoin can't do fractional lending. So there is no monetary tool that you can use on Bitcoin, which is what I mean by uh, people have to update their thinking and understand what tools will work, particularly in a decentralized world where there isn't a central point that you can go and shut down or control or jail or whatever. Cool. That's me. Any questions, comments on either the blockchain or anything else to do with Bitcoins? The biggest barrier to the international adoption of Bitcoin as a currency or as a technology? Uh, probably as a currency. As a currency, um, I see it struggling to get into mainstream adopters. So it's only got the early adopters. It hasn't got that killer application. I need Bitcoins because I can do something. Um, anyone who owns Bitcoins at the moment is looking around for ways to spend it. Um, and that just shows that the, there's immaturity and there isn't demand at the moment. So I think that's the biggest. And it's also partly a user, you know, the way virtual currencies, do I trust it? And it's all electronic. It's all just too hard for people. Um, technology, globally, I don't see many barriers. I think that's going to be a huge. Uh, the only barrier there is, in some ways, the blockchain is a solution looking for a problem. So we've got this wonderful solution, and now people are beginning to think, what can I do with this? So it's like people like me going around with a hammer looking for nails. So guess estimate of the technology si market size for the Bitcoin technology? Uh, no, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to pitch commercially. But, but what we're doing is reinventing the internet. That's trillions, right? So yeah. <laughs> But as a currency, I, I, I just see it a bit limited until we can find ways of using its electronic aspects. It will most certainly flourish in niches like international transfers. Uh, but mainstream adoption is still hard. And that's a lot of people are trying to get that going. But you know, it's money. Money is big. So how do we deal with the evil? Um, two ways. One is you plan for evil. So bitcoins planned for bad guys. And they said, how do we get trust in untrusted environments? Untrusted implies bad guys are there. So you can, you, there are ways of planning and uh, um, thinking about the bad guys in advance. The second is regulation. Right? Um, so someone like that um, Silk Road guy, they're going to continue. So you use your laws and your regulatory policies. Um, there's a lot of things around anti-money laundering, so there's no reason why it shouldn't apply to Bitcoins, because it's, it's still money. Um, and so a combination of you know, uh, software is, is law, uh, code is law. So you put it into the code, plus you regulate smartly. And where the Bitcoin industry seems to be at the moment is where there's full custodial control where somebody or something has the entire money at their 
they can do anything they want with the money. That's where you regulate. In the Bitcoin core network itself, that never happens. It's the wallets, it's the exchanges. Those are the parts that I think we should look at regulation as a positive. It will allow confidence and the industry to grow. It is an intervention of this, this libid, you know, this utopian community money. That, that's gone a long time back. Right now, the, the miners who make money are not you and I working at home. These are large mining pools. The last couple of years has completely destroyed the notion that this is you know, community doing good stuff for each other. Not happening. This is big corporate, big money happening. Thank you.